church and all my friends, I would share it. So <laughs> yeah, I get it. Trust me. I do the first four minutes of sitting there trying to navigate around the internet here to, to share the page appropriately. So right. I'm right with it. <laughs> good morning to you. This is the Preterist Power Hour, a ministry provided internet to you here through to share the page Preterist appropriately. Hour. So right. I'm right. with quiet. There we go. Good, good morning. Okay, there we are. Now we'll try this again so I don't have background. Good morning to you. Thank you for taking some time out of your day to join with us for what we like to call an hour of power. This is the Preterist Power Hour, a ministry provided to you through the Power of Preterism Network. You can learn more about our ministry, gain access to the host of things we might mention through this program, including our blog site, which is important for updates and resources. Uh, you could go ahead and find all of that at powerofpreterism.com. So we encourage you to do that. Uh, Pastor Jamie is going to be our interview this morning, and uh, both him and I are going about our business sharing this all over the place uh, where we can. So we thank you for being a part of this session this morning. Uh, we pray that God would be glorified. We're going to open up in a prayer here in a moment. Uh, we trust and pray that God would be glorified through all that we do. And uh, as we come to a conclusion of the program, I'll share more announcements. I would like to let you know how we do this Preterist Power Hour is every Monday and Friday at 1030 a.m., uh, we go live every Monday and Friday, that is, not through Friday, and Friday, 10.30 a.m. Eastern. Uh, we join at the beginning of the week. We join at the conclusion of the week. And what happens in between on Tuesdays and Thursdays is either interviews or sporadic moments where I just get to go live for an hour of power and share my thoughts or my studies for the day. So uh, we uh, hope that you might follow that format. Uh, I try to my best to upload everything to our WordPress site where you can gain uh, resources and every interview is chock full of discussion and resources. So uh, please avail yourself to powerofpreterism.com and gain those resources. Just to introduce myself briefly here, I'm Mike Miano. I'm the pastor of the Blue Point Bible Church. I am the director of the Power of Preterism Network, where we endeavor to provide clarity, healing, and strategy uh, in regards to revival and reformation happening in our day. We do believe that there is an advancement in power to the preterist view, and uh, we are excited to just magnify that and, and find interviews, resources, conversations, discussions, debates, whatever it might be uh, that would further those causes. So uh, again, thank you all for being a part of our session this morning. Uh, let me go ahead and open us in a word of prayer uh, to lead our prayer this morning. Uh, in the common prayer that I read, they had Psalm chapter 13 marked out, and I found it to be a beautiful reading. So I'm just going to read to you a couple verses, Psalm 13 verses three through six, and then I'll go ahead and open us in prayer. Here we read, Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Enlighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemy says, I have overcome him. Lest my adversaries rejoice when I am shaken. But I have trusted in your loving kindness. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountiful with me. Let's go ahead and praise God this morning. Heavenly Father, we do thank you, Lord. We thank you that even as we open up and we say, Heavenly Father, we know there's so many other titles and attributes that we could be praising you for this morning. You are gracious, you are loving, you are merciful, you are a counselor, you are a mighty God, you are a father, you are the Prince of Peace. Uh, Lord, so many things that we could be praying about and thanking you for this morning. Uh, however, we know your word tells us you've given everything to us pertaining to life and godliness. So this morning, Lord, in our discussion, in our time together, we ask that you magnify those things, that you help us, that you awaken our eyes, Lord, to the beauty that we have, to the bounty that we have in line with that song. And again, we praise you, Lord. We lift up that sacrifice of praise that you desire, and we give glory to your name. In and through the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. By the way, uh, this morning, uh, the common prayer that I do, by the way, I, I use commonprayer.net. If anyone's ever, in need, if you're ever in need of a moment to pray and you don't have the words, Go ahead, visit commonprayer.net, follow through with the ordered prayer. One of the citations in this morning's prayer was, if we'll be fools in this world, let us be fools for Christ. And uh, I believe that that is just so important in this day and age. Uh, there's a lot of foolish wisdom around us, a lot of foolish things happening. And it's important for us to lean in on the, the cross of Christ, which is in contrast to the cleverness of men uh, found right there in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. So, uh, Again, I'm excited to get in on our interview. Uh, Pastor Jamie, thank you for your time this morning. Uh, what I'm going to do is just kind of bring us right into it. And uh, Pastor Jamie, for those of you that don't know, is the pastor of New Covenant Church. I'm excited to learn a little bit more about his ministry and efforts there. And um, I know that from what I've noticed about Pastor Jamie is he's active, active in ministry, 
Uh, you know, I, I, I listened to this past Sunday's sermon on YouTube. I was encouraged by it. And uh, he's busy. Uh, that's why I'm grateful for you taking some time to join with us. And it seems as though he's a blessed man. He's set apart for the glory of God. And uh, I look forward to getting to know more. So Pastor Jamie, again, thank you. Uh, let's jump right into this and tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, where you grew up, uh, how you heard about this God named Jesus Christ. And uh, then I think we'll get right into things after that. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Mike. I really appreciate it. And uh, hey, before I begin to, uh, I just wanted to let you know that um, I really appreciate your ministry as well and, and everything you do. I actually, um, I learned about, I first laid eyes on you and learned about you and, and your um, your ministry and stuff. Uh, I think it was on YouTube. You know, I was just searching some preterism things and um, I caught on to one of your debates. And I, as you know, as many of your viewers probably know, there's a lot of your debates on there. And, um, you know, I watched it and I just remember thinking, you know, man, this guy is, is really a blessing. You know, he's willing to stand before, you know, people and just kind of share his heart. And there's not too many people that are willing to debate about these issues, you know, in public. So I remember just thinking like how, how bold I thought you were and just how awesome it was, you know, for you to get those debates out there, which have helped me understand a lot of my stuff uh, about preterism too. So I just wanted to thank you as well, you know, for your ministry and, and I appreciate you brother. But yeah, uh, so uh, as you said, my name's Jamie. I'm from a, a little town called El Campo, Texas. We were talking a little bit before uh, we began. Uh, it's a, a little bitty town. If you blink, you'll miss it when you're passing through it. Uh, well, we're like about an hour away from Houston and um, I've lived here all my life. It's like a little farming community. And uh, I found, or I should say the Lord found me when I was 17 years old in high school. Uh, I was, uh, you know, I was, I really wasn't like a troublemaker kid or anything like that in school or, you know, I just, I was just a normal guy, you know, with friends and, and things like that. But um, I always had like this, this longing in my heart is the way I describe it, like a hole in my heart, that there was something more to this life, you know, than just just graduating, getting a good job, getting married, making money, and then that's it. You know, like I felt like there was a higher purpose to life. I always felt that. And I always believed in God, you know, but I just never really had a, I never had a relationship with them. I was never saved, you know. And well, in high school, uh, my past, my co-pastor who co-pastors with me now, uh, his name's Larry Martinez. He's a big part of my life. We're actually roommates. He lives here in this house with me and we co-pastor together. So, uh, there's no assistant, uh, you know, he's a pastor, I'm the pastor, you know, of New Covenant Church. And, uh, you know, we do ministry together. And he was the one that actually witnessed to me and uh, brought me to the Lord. You know, he's, we started talking about the Bible. And we started having Bible studies in our little school cafeteria right there. And man, Mike, it was amazing, because like, it was just me, him, and maybe like two other kids. And we would talk about the Bible. And then before you know it, like more people out of nowhere would just come and start sitting at the table and just listening to what Larry and I were saying, you know, we were talking back and forth, you know, many different subjects were coming up, but it went like this for weeks at that school. And then one day, like I was just sitting there and I started looking around and I started noticing that there were teachers and principals there too, all standing around us, you know, in the room, the whole cafeteria was quiet, people just looking at us talking about the Bible. And you can tell they were being touched. And so, you know, that was kind of like my first dose of like realizing the power of God and the love of God, you know. And so anyways, I started going to church, you know, with Pastor Larry and, um, you know, I gave my life to God on a Wednesday night. And uh, hey, you know, before you know it, me and Larry were doing youth ministry for two years. Then after that, we left the church, you know, with the pastor's blessing, you know, we said we felt like, hey, it's time for us to kind of move on. And, and uh, we felt like God was leading us in another direction. So we started having a Bible study with just five people, me, him and uh, his grandmother and two other people just in a kitchen. And from there, more people started coming to that. And then the building, the, the, the room became too small for us to have Bible study in. So we had to get a building. And we got a building and then the rest is history. You know, more people started showing up. So, you know, I felt like what we were doing was, I, that's how I know it was of God, because it wasn't us who was making the ministry. You know, it was just God doing it. You know, people would come to us and say, we want to learn more. And then we just, we needed the means and we needed the building to do it. And so we've been in our building now since 2018. And uh, it's a small church. You know, I think like if everybody was to come on any given Sunday, 
it'd probably be like maybe around a hundred member congregation, you know, but we've been blessed, man. You know, the, the, the financial needs of the church are taken care of. Our church is, is wonderful and they're such good givers. And, uh, you know, more people are just coming and, and, uh, and, and the rest is history. That's where I'm at now. Uh, I'm where me and pastor Larry, we're pastoring this church together and uh, we're running a side, like an online ministry called New Covenant Way. But I don't want to get into that because I don't, I don't want to take up all your time with this one question, but we can get into it if you want. <laughs> well, actually, I, I might hold you there for a moment. So uh, one question I would ask is, as far as a denomination or distinctions of your church, uh, what would be some of those distinctions about your New Covenant church? Yeah, so that's that's good. Uh, I would uh, first, as far as religion goes, I would just say we're a non-denominational church. You know, we, we're not affiliated with anybody. But uh, the the message that we really focus on at our church is, uh, if I had to say it in one word or one phrase, I would say New Covenant, which is why we call ourselves New Covenant Church because we just believe that there is there's kind of a lack of understanding between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant in our Bibles, and we don't we think that there's a lot of Christians out there that really don't understand what that means to be under a new covenant. And what it means is, hey, you know, that we're under grace now, you know, we're not under law anymore. And what does that really mean for the life of a believer? What, what, what do we think about God? You know, what do we think about ourselves? And so we teach very heavily, like the message of grace, you know, the gospel of grace, and we teach uh, the new covenant. And then, uh, of course, the as far as eschatology goes, our view on that is preterism too. So we kind of put which is kind of foreign in our little community. You know, I'm sure everybody here in every church in our little community is, is a futurist, you know, so that kind of piques people's interest too. They want to hear what we have to say about preterism as well. And so, um, yeah, that's kind of like what we revolve around at our church. And then, like I said, we do that online ministry where we bring a lot of um, just Bible teaching to the picture because, uh, you know, if I had to say, if there's one thing that's missing, like in the body of Christ, I think it's teaching, like correct teaching, you know, people understanding why they believe what they believe and, and correctly interpreting the scriptures the way they should be. And so we try to teach the Bible in a simple yet entertaining way on New Covenant way so that people can understand it. And we do it from a grace-filled New Covenant perspective. And all that to say, we don't have all the answers, you know, we're, we're still learning ourselves, but our ministry is, is all about just saying, hey, we've studied, this is what we've learned. And we want to show it to you and, you know, give us your opinion on that as well. And let me hear what you have to say as well. Amen. Amen. True to form, you know, with the new covenant message, I, I, I had mentioned that I listened to your past Sunday sermon and that was, you know, what I got out of that message. There was no room for me to leave a service frustrated that I disagree with this preacher or anything like that. It was, it was beautiful. You, you exemplified the kingdom of God, the, you know, the new covenant, the way Christ wants to have a relationship with his people. And, uh, you know, again, so true to form, I, I thought it was beautiful. I encourage folks, you know, find New Covenant Church. Uh, we'll, we'll share some of the details, how you can follow along and find some of uh, Pastor Jamie's resources as we conclude the program today. So now I'm curious, you mentioned the New Covenant Way. So this is an online ministry that you're doing a teaching about, I guess, the New Covenant Way, correct? Yes, sir. Yeah, that's correct. All right. And uh, I appreciate how you said it. So there's a lot that needs to be outlined. As we know, in our current day, there's some that claim to be in the new covenant, but they live as though they're in the old covenant. And then there's some that live in the new covenant that don't understand there was an old covenant. So, you know, yeah. there's a lot going on that needs to be uh, better said, as you rightly pointed out, uh, good teaching is uh, needed. Uh, a testimony I often or a moniker I use in my teachings is zeal empowered by knowledge. Uh, you know, we don't want to be like the generation of the Apostle Paul, where they had a zeal for God that was not based upon knowledge. That's what he laments over there in Romans 9. So uh, let's let's be a people who desire that knowledge, pure, true, uh, what Peter calls the true knowledge of God, uh, in contrast to a lot of the false ideas that surround us. So, uh, you know, yeah. again, thank you, brother, for your commitment to, uh, you know, to the Lord, as it sounds as though when he got a hold of you, you just kept running. And that's beautiful. Uh, no man that puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. So, uh, you know, uh, praise God for that. And um, thank you for sharing. So uh, obviously I got a, to know a little bit about you before our uh, coming on the program. You're not married. You're waiting on the Lord, uh, serving in that regard and uh, no children at this point. Um, but uh, I'm, well, I guess we'll just continue to pray that the Lord will go before you and open up new doors. And, and Amen. Close Amen. And, and, and I am on Christian mingle. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm not on Christian mingle. 
Oh, fair enough. <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> As I told you before the program, I, I did serve in ministry as a single man. I think there's a lot of conversation that we could have in that regard. So, you know, Christian Mingle would probably be a, be a part of that conversation. Um, <laughs> that being said, brother, again, I, I appreciate you sharing some things candidly about, you know, God's work in you and through you. Um, I do believe I've had some communication with Larry Martinez. I know I follow him on Facebook and I'm friends with him. And uh, we've co- we've had some conversation here and there about preterism. So, I'm grateful that you serve with him. Uh, I'm excited to hear that you served. I didn't know you guys served that close together, uh, even in living quarters, which is beautiful. And um, thank you for that. Um, So what would you say as far as a a stay on the New Covenant Church for a moment, uh, when you come up with teaching, like, for example, uh, this past Sunday, you know, you preached a lot about that relationship with God and and, uh, the New Covenant message there. Do you have sermon series that you teach through or is it sort of like a unction of the lord this is what i'm going to teach on sunday how does that work yeah normally it's it's the latter it's like uh you know what i feel like the lord is kind of telling me uh you know to to preach for that sunday but um the 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 unique thing about me and pastor larry ministering together is that um we alternate so it's like he'll do one sunday i'll do another sunday and i mean we're so much in agreement it's like it's almost like we're one you know like with the, the stuff that we teach and it's, we've had our disagreements before on things but it's like 99% of the time you know, we're in agreement. So uh, we we don't, we normally don't do series at our church. I mean, right now, actually, um, but don't catch me lying though, because right now on Wednesday nights, uh, right now we're doing a series on Galatians right now. So, um, you know, we're going through the book of Galatians and teaching that, but like 90, 95% of the time, it's more just like an unction of the Holy Spirit, you know, um, which I think is so important, you know, today. I think that, um, I think that some ministers can get too caught up in doing series that they kind of miss the voice of the Lord, you know? And so I'm not saying that that's, if you're doing series, that's what's going to happen. I'm just saying that like, I think that we can get so caught up in just like the series that we're, we're, we're missing what the, the Holy Spirit is trying to, you know, tell to our church. And for me, I mean, personally, that's just the way it's always worked. You know, I kind of just sit down and I meditate and I just think about, you know, what's been going on lately, you know, what's been going on in my head, you know, what the Lord has been showing me. And uh, a lot of the times, like for me, um, this is kind of weird, but a lot of the times the Lord will just kind of drop a word in my spirit, you know? So like if it's discipleship, you know, and then I kind of just run with that. Or if it's like uh, a couple of weeks before uh, this Sunday, I thought about passion, you know, because I think that, you know, that there's one thing that we need in the church today, it's more passion, you know, people need to go after their relationship with God, be hungry for God, you know, things like that. And, um, and, you know, and then I just, I read the word and just, uh, you know, pray and just seek what the Lord is saying, and just try to make sure that, you know, I'm getting the right interpretation out of these scriptures and, and just portraying to the church what I feel in my heart. But that's just me personally. And I do recognize that I do recognize that other people have a different way about uh, going about things too. So yeah, amen. I don't know that there's a right or wrong. Uh, you know, I think there's some beautiful things you did highlight there. I know uh, when it comes to, uh, it could work against the church or it could work for a church when they follow the unction of that, that the spirit and make sure their pastor's doing the diligent work of studying for himself and right. coming up with a message versus, you know, a sermon series, whereas a sermon series could also hold you to it where you can't avoid something, you know, so there's, you can exactly. see problems um, that can come out of stuff like that. Um, I know uh, some here are are members of the congregation. I get the privilege to pastor and they'll tell you that, you know, we'll go through a sermon series, but if I feel the Lord speaking about something, you know what, I'm jumping right in the middle of that sermon series and speaking about this issue. So, uh, you know, always asking God, what do you want to say to the people and Lord, give me eyes to see and ears to hear. Amen. Amen. Uh, You know, I have to say, uh, brother Larry, I'll mention something about him uh, in uh, pastor Larry for that matter. He, uh, he had said, in the sermon this past Sunday in the service, at least he shared a a bit about why the music was going a bit longer than usual. And I thought that was beautiful. You know, I said, Hey, speak to me, Lord, you know, just nurturing that, that relationship. And I know we talk about that here at the church as well. We've taken up uh, doing a moment of silence, you know, just realizing, you know what, there was a lot that we wanted to get done this week. There was a lot that we probably didn't uh, a lot that, you know, we know people show up to service sometimes thinking about what they need to get done the week ahead already. And I I try to center everybody. You're here. Right. Right. Not here. Uh, right. You know, so <laughs> it's just take like, a moment out of your busy day to just, we got so much going on, but let's just give this time to the Lord. Right. That's right. That's right. You know, I think that is that sacrifice of praise, just recognizing his sovereignty and saying, well, whatever I didn't get done, God, you didn't want it done, you know, That's and right. I, I get to it this week was you give me the opportunity. So amen. 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 
Yeah, so, that's kind of that's kind of where we're like we're we're at like with our church right now. I think um, you know, like I had mentioned, you know, passion. You know, like I think there's that's one of the things that we can miss as a church. You know, like we're we're not we're not coming here every Sunday just to have a good service. You know, just to hear a good word and then go home and do absolutely nothing with it. You know, we're coming here because we want to learn about the word and we want to grow in our relationship with God. And so we can't ever forget, you know, that we need to have passion and just commitment in our life, you know, because, hey, as Christians, it is a grace filled life, you know, and the work is finished, but it still does take sacrifice on our part, you know, to build our relationship with God and to get closer to him, you know, because, hey, the, as the word says, you know, the earth is groaning, you know, for the manifestations of the, of the sons and daughters of God, you know, so like we need to you know, make sure that we keep that passion. And as the Bible says, you know, stir that flame, stir that fire, stir it up on the inside of you. So that's kind of, that's kind of where my heart's been lately. So. Amen. You know, when the sons of God know what they can provide, I'll tell you uh, that can change the world. Uh, that's what changes the world. Amen. Amen. Uh, if he's given all things to us pertaining to life and godliness, and we have those things as the children of God, how much more should we feel burdened to bring those things into this world and to see man flourish, you know? Amen. You preaching now, brother. Hey, I hear you. I hear you. Get me going. You know, before I go a bit further, this is a bit off the cuff. It wasn't on the notes, but I'm curious to hear what are some of your influences in ministry? Who are some of the people that you've learned from? Obviously, you've learned from the spirit of God and and Jesus himself. But who are some of the people that maybe you've learned about ministry, maybe some books you've read? Who are some of those influences in your life? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, Well, for me, like my the the uh, journey into grace that began with the book for me and uh that's how god delivered it, delivered it to me and it was joseph prince's book destined to reign uh and so when i read his book it was like it was completely uh life changing to me because like i had never seen the gospel that way before you know there's all these scriptures about you know grace and just you know hey we're forgiven you know all this this good news stuff but for me like i um I, maybe I should have said this earlier, but, you know, I came from a Pentecostal background. That's the church I was going to, you know, that's where the women have the long hair and wear the dresses, no makeup. And, uh, Hey, I couldn't be having this beard right now. I'd be going to hell, you know, if I had this beard. And so I was in religion, you know? Uh, and so I was, I was one of those hellfire, you know, preachers. I really, I didn't preach in my church, but that's kind of the, kind of the stuff that I heard. Uh, it was, it was a great church though. You know, I'm not saying anything bad about it because it taught me a relationship with God. It's just, I really didn't ha- capture the message of grace there until I read that book. And I'm like, wait, you know, I'm, I'm missing a lot of stuff in my relationship with God. You know, the church world has it wrong in a lot of areas, you know, because this is we're we're not under an old covenant, you know, we're under a new covenant. So Joseph Prince, uh, his book and his couple other books he wrote after that really influenced me. And uh, also, I would say uh, Lynn Howes. I'm not sure if anybody's familiar with him, yeah, uh, yeah. but yeah, I enjoy his sermons. Uh, you know, he's preached at our church once before, and uh, he actually, I shared the that I was going live a minute ago. He actually put a heart on the post, so uh, he's been a big influence in my life, and uh, if I can say anybody else, I mean, there's there's really a lot of people I can say. I mean, I love the teachings of Jensen Franklin. I mean, uh, I, I love his sermons, you know, um uh is uh, but if there's anybody i guess that's been like the biggest influence in my life is pastor larry i mean because he's the one that that you know brought me to the lord and you know he taught me the scriptures and then now i'm sitting up here you know with him and we're teaching together now i teach him and he teaches me you know so um uh, i i give a lot of credit to him you know he's a big part of my life so well, praise god well you better warn him we're going to be hunting him down to get him on the preterist power hour so yeah uh, i'm sure he's he's going to want to come on so <laughs> And we also had uh, Pastor Lynn Hiles on the program, actually, a couple of weeks back. Uh, he was one oh, of our nice. guests as well. So, yeah, definitely blessed by him and his resources. Joseph Prince, I have to say, uh, that was uh, destined to reign. Uh, I remember years ago uh, when I was journeying into the preterist view uh, and, and kind of undoing the religion in my world, in my life, um, Joseph Prince was a recommended resource. And I actually went to the bookstore. I used to make this a habit. I didn't buy the book. I just sat down in the book aisle, pulled it out. It's one of those books that you could do that, you know, and just read and right. soak up the, the, the grace and the love of God. So, yes, uh, you know, I definitely encourage folks to lean in on those resources. Uh, Jensen Franklin, I, I've never, I've never heard that name. So that's going to be a new one. I might do some digging. Uh, maybe I'll ask you to send some resources a little later. Uh, I love to learn from new people and meet new people. So um, and of course, Pastor Larry, I already have him tabled here for uh, some discussion. 
Yeah, yeah, awesome, awesome. Oh, and I guess I can mention Mike too. Um, I really enjoyed Gary Demar's book, Last Days Madness. You know, uh, this is a good because I know this is the Predator's Power Hour. So, like, if anybody's looking for a good book to read about, um, you know, in times and a Predator's approach, you know, you can check out Last Days Madness. Uh, and I should mention also, I was kind of just thinking of names. I kind of had a, a brain freeze there for a minute, but also, um. Jonathan Welton. Uh, I think he's a great uh, teacher and he's teaches a preterist approach to his books, like understanding the whole Bible, uh, raptureless. Uh, those are good books that have been an influence on me. Like for me, the kind of books I enjoy is I really, I just enjoy theology books. Like I like learning about the Bible and, 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 you know, teaching books that teach me something new, you know, so I would recommend those books too. Amen. Authors that like books. That's a good thing. Take note of that, folks. Here's all. Amen. That like. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's right. Um, yeah, we're going to get in. Matter of fact, uh, Pastor Jamie has some books that we're going to get into here in a moment and uh, talk a bit about. Uh, you mentioned the word preterism. So let's uh, unpack that for a bit here. My communication with you obviously was, uh, as you had mentioned, you first came across my face. Sorry to hear that on YouTube and uh, <laughs> uh, doing a debate. And I I've had the privilege of participating in debates and growing through those debates. You know, uh, I don't do debates as a, a means to an end. They sort of are the uh, journey for me. Um, you know, as I've had the privilege of being in the pulpit with, you know, some smart men, you know, that uh, right. disagree with me pretty strongly and um and have had to divide these things and i always re-watch my debates you know i always joke with people i'm like you know the, the video has about twenty thousand views i'm probably a good fifteen thousand of those views just going back <laughs> and review um you know so uh i think it's important so you and i we i realized i did a little bit of going back back in may 2020 you had communicated with me and uh, our communication was namely over the book of Revelation, which continues to, you know, be a question for a lot of folks. Mm -hmm. And uh, you had asked me a good question. I thought it was good to bring it up here. And I'd be interested to hear where your study has gone since then. Uh, I'll just read what I wrote here in my notes. Um, how were the churches of Asia Minor, those addressed in the book of Revelation, affected by the Roman Jewish war? Uh, for instance, the promise to shield the Philadelphian church from judgment, Revelation 3, 10 through 11, is meaningless if that judgment doesn't occur beyond the borders of that city. And obviously the, the, the small phrase that I offered back to you was, you know, uh, locally accomplished, trans locally or universally, in, uh, universally significant. And I shared some links with you. Um, one was actually from Gary DeMar. And I went back to that this morning and did some reading. And, uh, you know, Gary, I always have to give him kudos. He, he does such a great job and we're not in agreement in all the different areas and pieces. However, uh, you know, I'm always grateful that Gary's willing to have conversation. I know, matter of fact, right now, he's actually currently in conversation with some folks. He's always willing to challenge himself and challenge others. So uh, I might share that link if anyone's interested, because uh, it, it responded to some of the, the seven churches conversation there. And then also I shared another link from Revelation Revolution um, and uh, some of the thoughts. So uh, Mike, I'm curious, you know, have you found a response to that that you would offer up uh, in regards to the book of Revelation? You know, why is it written to these seven churches of Asia Minor? But yet it uh, it speaks of the destruction of Babylon, which most would recognize to be uh, the city of Jerusalem, the first century uh, Jerusalem. What, what are your thoughts? Yeah, yeah. So like, yeah, that was the question I had, um, because so to make it like more simpler, the question I had was this. OK, we preterists, we're saying that all or most of the book of Revelations is concerning the destruction of Jerusalem that happened in the year A.D. 70. So we would say that Jesus was writing in Revelations 3, and he was telling these churches, and he was saying, look, there's destruction that's coming. So if you want to be saved from this destruction, or if you want to be left out of it, then do such and such and such. And so we would say, yeah, you see, that's why he's writing to the seven churches of Asia Minor. But the question, the reason why I asked you that question, Mike, was because I, I think I read it somewhere, and I, I never heard anybody ask that question, so I needed an answer to it. And it's a good question because what a futurist person would say is like, okay, well, if you guys say that this is all about the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, why would Jesus be telling this church in Philadelphia and all these other churches in Asia Minor that are hundreds of miles away from Jerusalem? Why would he be telling them that destruction is going to come on them? I thought you said it was to Jerusalem. You know, you know what I, I hope that I hope that uh, the viewers can understand that question. But why would Jesus be telling them that 
I want to save you from the destruction. Why would he be telling these cities that if they're hundreds of miles away from a localized destruction in Jerusalem, which is what we say. And so I really didn't have an answer for that. That was interesting. But yeah, I did some research and, um, uh, you know, I read a few resources and um, I learned basically that these, the seven churches, they're actually, basically they're in between Rome and Jerusalem. So what a lot of that's why history is so important when people study their Bible, because it, it, it kind of unlocks a lot of things. There was actually a main road, like a postal route that went that went from Rome to Jerusalem. So if an army was marching from Rome to Jerusalem to destroy it, which is what they did in AD 70, they would go through these cities and they would go through them. And within these cities, there are. Jewish settlements, there's Christian settlements within these cities. And so the impact of what happened to Jerusalem in AD 70 would have definitely infected all of these other little surrounding cities as well. It's like, um, like I told, like I said at the beginning, uh, I'm from El Campo, which is about an hour away from Houston. Well, like if something was going down in Houston and it was so big, the radius was so big it would infect El Campo as well because we're close to Houston. No, the, the, the destruction itself, the apex isn't happening in El Campo. It's happening in Houston, but the impact of that would affect the surrounding cities and the, and the surrounding suburbs. And so destruction and, and just the, the unfortunate circumstances that would happen would affect these little cities as well and the Jewish settlements as well. So Jesus is saying, you know, hey, if you don't want to be caught up in, you know, what the Romans are doing, you know, then start believing the gospel, you know, then start, then uh, start seeing it, start repenting, start seeing things this way. And then the destruction that does pass through your cities on its way to Jerusalem won't affect you. So I hope that makes sense. Uh, but that's kind of the conclusion that I came to. And I'm not sure if that's uh, kind of what you understand about it too, Mike. Yeah, I think you, you explained it very well. Um, you know, I think it's important to know that while, again, it was providing clarity to these people that would be affected by this greater event that was happening, obviously what the focus of a lot of Bible prophecy is, um, that they would be affected by it. And it's giving them some wisdom so that they wouldn't be, you know, again, isn't that what most of our New Testament is, is to try to help provide some clarity in the midst of confusion. Amen. Uh, you know, you see Corinth right now, we're currently going through the book of Corinthians here at our church. And you see the whole letter is basically, listen, you guys are confused about a whole lot of stuff. So let's help you get an understanding of, you know, baptism. Let's help you get an understanding of uh, the cleverness of men and what some people are teaching and what you need to be thinking about. And the whole letter, in my estimation, the whole New Testament is helping provide clarity in the midst of confusion. If I might share a, a quote that I found from that article I mentioned by Gary DeMar, he said it like this. He said, Revelation actually, let me get right to the right quote. Sorry, excuse me. The book of Revelation is not a warning uh, of simply what was going to happen to Israel. Jesus had made it clear 35 years before in the Olivet Discourse. Revelation was delivered to seven churches made up of Christians as a wake-up call. They would suffer the same fate of as Israel if they followed in the theological moral footsteps of Israel. So that's why you see Babylon constantly being this picture in Revelation. Uh, many of you know that I've often taught the best way to understand the book of Revelation is to ask yourself, as Dr. Don K. Preston has, who is this Babylon? Once you identify Babylon, the rest of the book becomes not so much, I wouldn't say easy, but it becomes easier to understand, especially in light of what we're saying here this morning. So Gary goes on to say that um, it, was, it was a warning to the seven churches as a wake-up call. They would suffer the same fate as Israel if they followed in the theological moral footsteps of Israel. The indictments that are leveled against the seven churches with old covenant judgment language, even the threat to come in judgment if they didn't wake up pervades the two chapters. They were about to suffer these things uh, that were about to happen. So again, I, I appreciate the way you outlined that, that looking at these cities as sort of middlemen, that mm -hmm. while they're not the focus of the, the prophecies that we see in Revelation, uh, again, it depends how you say that, because they are yeah. the focus, right? the church is the focus. Um, yeah. But then, I, I would also, I'm sorry, Mike, um, uh, please. I, I would also say too that like, you know, the futurist approach is that 
the futurist approach is that all this is going to happen in the future. Well, it also would not make sense in the futuristic approach to tell these churches that destruction is going to fall on them if it's going to happen 2000 years later, you know, so it, like it doesn't make sense in the futurist uh, way to see it as well, you know, and then I think a lot of it also goes back to um, we just need to know that the Bible was written in Greek, at least the New Testament was in Greek. And uh, the words he actually uses in that scripture in Revelations 3, he says, I'm paraphrasing, but he says, I'm going to save you from the destruction that comes in the world. And the world, the world, the Greek word there is oikumene, which means basically the, if, if I can be simple about it, it's the Roman Empire. So he was saying, I'm going to save you from the destruction that comes, comes upon the Roman Empire and the destruction that comes upon your land. You know, so he's, again, he's just making that localized picture of, yeah, it's going to happen here in Jerusalem. That's going to be the apex, the center. But yeah, if all you other surrounding cities, you know, like you said, are caught up and, you know, not believing the gospel, not believing the new covenant, then the destruction that the Romans bring can actually affect you as well. Amen. Yeah, well said. And, and you know, there's so many resources that you could dive into. Uh, I'll make mention of a few. Uh, Before Jerusalem Fell by Kenneth Gentry. That's, a, I know, a book that has helped a lot of folks understand the book of Revelation uh, from a preterist view. Obviously, he's not full preterist, but at least it leans in on helping you get an understanding of the preterist view in regards to Revelation. Uh, Ed Stevens actually wrote a book called The Final Decade Before the End. And in that book, he has a, a, a pretty good chart, uh, you know, a, a extensive chart. That's what I'm looking for. It was very good, uh, pretty extensive is what I wanted to say. Um, a chart that helps you see those two, those churches, those seven churches, and ultimately the history that was happening right there and what ended up happening to them. I know some like to share a picture of the church of Ephesus of today. And as you might know, it's, you know, just a grassy field, you know, uh, where <laughs> Ephesus used to be. So uh, we know those churches, unfortunately, a lot of those churches did not walk worthy. Uh, they deserted the call uh, leading up to the, the Roman Jewish war. So, uh, you, you know, there's a lot to learn there. And what I think you pointed out a great point is that both views provide questions. Both views have right. issues and, and, and things that need to be further studied through and challenged. So um, let's continue studying the word of God. Amen. And, and Amen. Scriptures. Um, so yeah, there's a lot that could be said in, in that regard. And I know uh, recently we had some discussion about the book of Revelation, uh, the internal ex evidence, external evidence for the late, the early date, late date, et cetera. And uh, we welcome some conversation about that. Uh, I do want to speak to this and I, I'm curious to hear your answer. Um, if Revelation's been entirely fulfilled, uh, this was the, the charge of my brother Bodhi Bakum, by the way, uh, somebody I admire, but this was his charge against preterism. If Revelation is all fulfilled, then it means nothing to us today. And I want to speak against that. And I want to let you know that just because something is fulfilled, uh, that doesn't, the old covenant is fulfilled. That doesn't mean that we can't learn from it. Uh, yes, I believe the coming of the Lord is fulfilled, but that means that it, it, it provided something to us, the presence right. of God that we now relish and celebrate so and live in. So um, that's my understanding of that. How would you respond to people saying, well, Pastor Jamie, you know, if you say the book of Revelation has been fulfilled, then what does it mean for us today? Amen. That's an excellent question because I get asked that a lot. That's probably like the number one question that people ask. And I would just say this, like the way I said it in, in the book I wrote uh, is like this. The end of Revelations is the beginning of your story as a Christian, because yeah, to me, and it goes back to understanding what Revelations is all about. You know, Revelations is about revealing the new covenant. It's about revealing Jesus. And it's about the new covenant coming out from under the veil of the old covenant. And so when that old covenant veil, when it's removed, now we don't have that hindrance over us anymore. Now we don't have that rain cloud over the new covenant and now we are free from that. And so now we're free to bring the gospel and bring the kingdom to the world. And so, like, as you said, yeah, revelations is, is fulfilled. You know, all of that stuff is fulfilled. Okay, but what do we do now? Well, that's where you come in. That's where the Great Commission comes in. That's where your story begins. Your, your job, I always tell Christians this, is just to bring the kingdom to the earth. You know, the way God's kingdom looks in heaven is the way we need to make it here on the earth. You know, we have a mission here uh, to tell people about the gospel, you know, to, to get them saved, you know, to tell them about Jesus and the new covenant. And part of that, a big part of that is telling people that, yes, revelations has been fulfilled. So you can now live under the, a complete uh, free form of the new covenant. So uh, it, to me, like when people ask that, it, it's, it comes from 
many, many years of them just being bombarded with futurist doctrine. You know, they have this mindset of we got to get out of here. We got to get out of here. That's 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 the mindset. You know, the Lord is ready to come at any moment. So I've heard stories of people that don't even go to college because they think the Lord is going to come any day. You know, there's movements that don't start. There's there's revolutions that don't happen because people are so concerned with getting out of here. You know, but we're supposed to be we're supposed to occupy until he comes and not and not be occupied with his coming, if I can say it like that. So we're supposed to we but for me, like because I should have mentioned this, too, at the beginning at, at the Pentecostal church I was a part of. It was so unique because the pastor there was actually a preterist. And a lot of people in the UPC movement are not, well, I don't, I don't, I don't know the statistics, but a lot of people are not preterist, I would say in the UPC movement. So our church was kind of like an outcast among the UPC movement because he was a preterist. That's where I learned it from. And then when I came to grace, I kept that uh, because it clicks so well, you know, with the message of grace. But like, for me, it's easy to understand that, yeah, we, we, we still have a mission to bring the kingdom of God here to the earth. You know, we still have a job to do. And it, again, it's just to bring the kingdom. It's just to witness to people and just to, and to be the hands and feet of Jesus here on the earth. But I can see why somebody would ask that question. And it's usually just because they have this exit mentality. There's nothing else to do, but to get here, but to get off the earth and just to wait for his coming. So a lot of it goes back, I would say, in my opinion, just to your background and what you've been taught, you know, and it's, it's all about unlearning what we've been taught so that we can come to something new and better. Amen. Well said. Uh, yeah, I often highlight, uh, we're not watching and waiting, but we're possessing and increasing in the things of God. So, you know, I, I, I quoted like there on the new covenant to, to, you know, free to bring the kingdom to the world. And that's our job. I, you know, I sit there sometimes and I listen to folks and I'm like, have you actually read the last two chapters of the book of Revelation? Right. You know, when, they, when they ask me that question, that's usually what I ask. I'm like, well, if you read the last two chapters, even, you know, talking about brother Vody Bakum, that's something I'm looking forward to talking to him personally about is let's just read through revelation mm -hmm. 21 through 22 and you tell me that when everything is accomplished that there's nothing else to do right you, know, you, know, you can have a hard time with that uh you know there's this water of life that we have access to and uh hopefully as believers we know that anything you're blessed to have it is your requirement your job your part of your discipleship to provide that to others so that's right you know, that's what we're doing we're taking this water of life that we've come to to have because he has indeed fulfilled these things and done everything necessary. God's done everything necessary to give us access to the water of life. Now he's telling his church, get out there and make it known uh, to the Amen. world. So, you know, that, that hopefully you see that when you read through the book of Revelation. And I encourage folks to do that. Just take the time out, read through the text and ask yourself, well, if this has been fulfilled, what does this mean for me today? Amen. And hopefully Amen. you'll find yourself as one of those that are saying, come and drink Amen. of the water of life. Exactly. So, brother, you mentioned some books. Let's get into that. You uh, you mentioned, and by the way, uh, you know, I'm curious. I wanted to highlight this. Uh, I know we talked a little bit off the air about preterism, and there's a divide in the preterist community, right? There's the uh, there's some that believe all things are fulfilled, and it means nothing for us today. Let's put a thumbs down for that view. Okay. Right. Uh, <laughs> uh, then there's some that believe that you know. I, I would say I'm a full preterist. That means I believe that yes, everything, judgment, resurrection, new heavens, new earth, it's all been fulfilled. Um, and then we know that there's also partial preterists, right? Those that, uh, and again, I think that you probably know this as well, that the partial preterist camp is kind of divided as that what they're saying, where they're saying, and I think it's important to really hear people out in what they're saying they believe has been fulfilled and ultimately mm -hmm. what they're waiting for. So I'm just curious, you know, in your studies, uh, where have you kind of, where do you feel comfortable uh, with saying this has been fulfilled? And maybe what are some of the things that you feel uh, that we need to better help people study through to find out what needs is further going to be fulfilled, or uh, maybe some other studies that you believe are important in regards to this preterist conversation. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, so I guess like kind of where I'm at more, if I had to pick a spot, I would say I'm more of a partial preterist. But sometimes I wake up and I feel like a 75% preterist. And yeah. then sometimes I feel like I, I told me and Pastor Larry, were actually laughing about that not too long ago that you know, hey, sometimes we feel like we're 75% preterist, you know, a partial, I guess, would be 50, maybe 75% preterist, and then full preterist, because I actually have, you know, a lot of my friends are preterists, and um, I would say maybe like 60% are full preterists, and then the other 40% are partial preterist, I would say, but yeah, I kind of lean more to the partial preterist side, um, and, you know, we kind of did, we kind of talked a little bit about it yesterday, but to me, it's kind of, 
I think what what partial preterists see it as is it going back to like the resurrection. And uh, we kind of like like you had mentioned the resurrection a second ago, Mike, but like, you know, when we read scriptures like First Corinthians 15 and Philippians chapter three and, and you know, just passages like that, that kind of talk about the resurrection, you know, saying that, hey, one day uh, your body is going to be resurrected and it's going to be glorified. And in the same way Jesus was resurrected is the same way that we're going to be resurrected. And well, like for me, just to make it simple, like when I look at the resurrection of Jesus, I see that Jesus did have a spiritual body, but he also, it was also a fleshly body as well. And so I look around and like, I don't, I don't see that resurrection as happening yet. And so to me, that general resurrection, that ultimate resurrection at the end of all things is still awaiting us in the future. Now, I know that there's holes in that. And uh, like, just like, like, like you said, there's holes in partial preterism and hey there's probably holes in full preterism too but the main thing is just the uh i would say resurrection that that's kind of where where i'm kind of stuck with it and that's kind of why i'm sitting on that and then and then the upc pastor that taught me i think he was actually a partial preterist as well and then also the uh the 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 great judgment at the end of the millennial reign not to get too theological for the viewers out there but you know there's a there's a millennial reign and I believe that the millennial reign, I believe that, that we're living in that now, the thousand year reign. You know, I think that, uh, you know, after the destruction of Jerusalem and or at least I should say around the crucifixion of Jesus, you know, there's the thousand year reign. And as you know, which we can agree on, Mike, you know, the thousand years just means a long time. You know, it just means a super long time. And I think that we're in that. And then at the end of the millennial reign, uh, where I'm sitting now, where I'm comfortable with is that at the end of that millennial reign, that's going to be the resurrection. That's going to be the ultimate end of all things and the great white throne judgment and things like that. But it's kind of like we were uh, saying yesterday, I really don't focus on that too much. And honestly, like I haven't really, uh, just to be totally transparent, like I really haven't studied the differences between full and partial preterism too much because a lot of my time is just focused on reaching futurists, you know, just getting people to be preterists, plain and simple. And like, there's so much work to be done in that area. It's like, I, I just haven't had time to really research the, you know, the difference between the two, you know, and, and I think it's so much more important, you know, just to reach futurists and just to get them to get them to see that all or most of revelation just fulfilled, you know, things like Matthew 24 or the whole chapter of Matthew 24 is fulfilled, you know, and just to get them to see, so they, they, they don't expect this coming, this literal second coming that's not going to happen, you know, anytime soon. And uh, I think that, like, if I focus my efforts on that, it's like there's so much work to be done that that just kind of demands most of my attention right there, if I could say it like that. But does that make sense? It does. Absolutely. And I appreciate, you know, I appreciate you uh, being willing to be transparent and share some of that. Uh, the reason I ask that is because I believe it's important. I have a, kind of a, a twofold ministry here where I agree with you and I definitely am a part of helping futurists come to understand preterism. However, another part of the ministry that I lead in uh, uh, lead is helping preterists better explain the things that they're saying. Because as you know, uh, a lot of times the holes, you, you mentioned holes in the views, right? A lot of times right. the holes in the views are there because people aren't understanding exactly what we're trying to get across. Mm -hmm. uh, right. And maybe we're not saying it in a way that's palatable uh, for them. So, right. uh, you know, part of our effort here with the Preterist Power Hour is to have honest conversation and to ask, you know, where are areas that we've we've really hammered it out? I think, you know, the Preterist community, we've hammered out Matthew 24. Mm -hmm. You know, we've seen that take its place in the church. I think by and large, the dispensational futurist view is waning in the Christian church. People are more and more, praise be to God, are realizing that that's not correct. That's a system that Amen. is a false interpretation. Now, in the preterist community, what I think we need to do, uh, for example, this morning, I, I saw a post on social media. There's a group called Preterist Churches. And uh, on that group, uh, a woman had shared, she's looking for a partial preterist church in her community. Now, of course, Mike Miano has to jump in there and say, well, why would you want a partial community when you could have a full, you know, come on, full. Uh, you know, uh, and uh, what her response was, which you know, made me take a step back was, well, I want a little bit more than folks that are content with the way things are. And I said, oh, yeah, she she threw it back. Can yeah. you handle it, Mike? <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and that was a good challenge. And I realized, you know, the full preterist community need, needs to do a better job if they're going to, you know, if we're going to get together as preterists and we're going to 
you know, again, there's going to be differences. There's, there's been differences since the day of the apostle Paul and Peter, uh, you know, I don't know that we're ever going to get to a point where there's no differences in the church. Matter yeah. of fact, I think that runs against a new covenant orthopraxis. And I say that because the apostle Paul in texts like first Corinthians eight, Romans 14, he leaves room for disagreement. He leaves mm -hmm. room, you know, you follow your convictions, you meet with folks that have the same convictions as you and manifest the kingdom of God in that, in your, that regard, do that. Right. Uh, you know, so I, I think that there needs to be a healthy agree to disagree mentality in the Christian church, uh, right. even over things like this particulars. So um, for me, uh, I do think, and I appreciate you sharing some of those texts. I just think this, the preterists need to, you know, we, we've belabored the, the last days, the time statements, audience relevance, Matthew 24. Maybe we need more studies in these areas and, mm -hmm. you know, helping folks. Uh, obviously, I'm teaching through Corinthians now, so I might send you my first Corinthians sermon uh, probably in the next year and a half when we get there. We tend to take our time here at Blue Point. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, but again, I appreciate you, you all opening up a little bit. It just shows me some areas that, and maybe some other preterists, areas that we want to dig in a bit and understand what we're saying and what we're not saying, because I'll let you folks know. I believe it's all been fulfilled. However, I do not believe that God is content with the world the way that it is. I'm not content as a believer, of the one who has access to the water of life. I'm not content with the thirsty folks that I see out there. And, you know, that being said, hopefully, you know, that the, my understanding of full preterism is not, well, we're just, this is what God gave us. That's it, folks. You know, mm -hmm. thank God for this. Um, no, I believe it, it's possessing and increasing in the things of God. So right. um, thank you for allowing me to belabor that point. Uh, that being yeah. said, brother, share with us some about your books. I know you have two books that I know of. Uh, how to understand the Bible in 30 days. Uh, and then what does the Bible say about tithing? Uh, I believe you published the 30 day book first, correct? Yes. Yes, sir. So tell us a bit. And if you have others, please mention them as well. Yeah, no, th these are, these are the two books that I have right now. Uh, like you said, how to understand the Bible in 30 days. And um, that is just a book that helps a normal person. It can be, it can be a person who doesn't know anything about the Bible, even a person that's not a Christian. It can help that person walk away and have a better understanding of the Bible. And it can help Christians today just get a better grasp of what the Bible is actually teaching. And it's laid out in days, not chapters. So it's like day one, day two, day three, because it's designed uh, to read one, one chapter a day. Uh, of course, you can read it however you want, you know, if you just want to read the whole thing through. But if you just read one chapter a day, it takes a subject about the Bible. Uh, for example, it tells you like what the Bible is all about. What is the new covenant? What is the old covenant? Uh, and then there's a section in there about actually studying the Bible, because I think that's a tool that needs to be talked about more is like, how are we actually supposed to be studying the Bible? You know, where, how, how do we come to our conclusions about this? So there's a section in there about that. And then there's a section about like just basic doctrines in Christianity, like forgiveness, um, repentance, you know, eternal security, different stuff like that. And then the last section of my book, the last seven or eight chapters, I believe it is, I believe it's seven, uh, is about the end times, you know, about understanding all of these end time scriptures. Cause I think that the preterist approach is what's, is a thing that's really missing in the church. You know, there's all these end time scriptures that, that people are confused about. And I think that's actually such a big part of the Bible that we're just not talking about is eschatology. And mm -hmm. so the last section is about that. So it's, a uh, it's, it's, it's very simple, you know, like I, I've read, I've read a lot of theological books and I think a lot of Christians are turned off, like from learning and from, from teaching and from theology because of all the books and, and the resources that are available. It's all up here when they're down here, you know? And so we want to try to get them to come up a little bit more at a time. And so we have to make our teaching and we have to make our books more simple, you know, for people to understand. And so I try to, you know, kind of make it a little simple to understand, you know, there's pictures and easy language and things like that in there. It's about a 380 page book. Uh, and then I have, uh, what does the Bible say about tithing? Actually, I have it right here. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, this book, it's, it's, it's way smaller. It's about, a, I don't think it's no more than 100 pages, but it started just as me uh, wanting to understand tithing, you know, and a long time ago I did. And so the best way for me to understand something, Mike, is for, is to just sit down and write it, to write out what the scriptures are saying, what I think it's saying, you know, so I read books and I read the Bible and then I come to my conclusion and then I write it down. And so before I knew it, I ended up having pages and pages in a word document about tithing. And I'm like, well, 
I should just offer it on new covenant way to see if anybody wants the notes. And then a lot of the, a lot of my friends, they don't read digital copies. So they like paperback copies, which I do too. And so I turned it into a book, a paperback copy. So uh, it's about, it's about tithing. You know, I'm, I'm, I don't know what everybody out there believes, but uh, I personally don't believe that uh, tithing is required or suggested in the new covenant church. You know, a lot of, a lot of people who do teach tithing, they say that, Hey, it's, it's, we're not required to do it, but you still need to do it, which kind of doesn't make sense because it's like, we're saying it's a principle that you need to follow in order to be blessed, but there's no scripture that says that. And so in this book, I just kind of say, Hey, why this is why I feel the way I do about it. Uh, I'm not the tithing police. I don't think it's wrong or evil. If you do tithe your money, I just think that if you do it with the, with the mindset that you're going to be cursed, if you don't do it, or if you do it with the mindset that the Bible vehemently teaches that you need to tithe, that's an incorrect belief, in my opinion, and that belief needs to change. You know, we all need to have correct beliefs about the Bible and what we teach. So uh, I, I just kind of outlined that and then different things like uh, Hebrews 7, Abraham's tithe uh, are mentioned in this book. You know, what does new covenant giving look like? Uh, hey, just yesterday in the service, you know, I told everybody, I said, hey, uh, you know, I know that gas prices are high. I know that hamburger meat is high. I know that eggs are high. You know, I went to the store and bought a 12 pack of soda the other day. It was like six bucks. I said, but still you got to give, you know, so I'm not against giving, but giving and tithing are not the same thing. You should still give, you should, you should give a bountiful gift to your church to help to support the ministry, but it does not have to be 10%. That's all I say. I think the Bible is clear. It just says it's a bountiful gift, you know? So that's the, that's what I kind of outline in this book. And uh, so far it's, it seems to be helping a lot of people. Amen. You know, I don't know if you published on the heels or if you published before Creflo Dollar's recent uh, admission that, you know, tithing, he now has run against his teaching of tithing over the years, which, you know, I praise God for. And um, I don't pretend to know people's motives uh, and uh, I don't try to make that my business. However, when I see a man go from false to true and at least encouraging folks that, you know, he was wrong about something, I praise God for that. So uh, I, I thought of that right when you published it, when I saw your book, I said, I think he published that before Creflo Dollar. So who knows? Maybe yeah. he helped out Creflo Dollar. <laughs> yeah, somebody, one of my church members even texted me and they made me laugh. Uh, she texted me a link to the video like a day after he preached it. And she said, oh, he must have read your book. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, I'll admit, uh, I've, I've continued to have some issues with uh, early on in my ministry. I didn't understand why pastors get paid. Uh, you know, I was like paid pastors. That's weird. Um, where do you find that in the Bible? Uh, and I've had a, a go some undergo some deconstruction and reconstruction, if you will, mm. in that area. So I might, matter of fact, lean in on your resource, because I think it's an area where preachers, especially those that open up for a offering on a Sunday, um, I think that it's important to get a good handle on what we're saying and what we're not saying. I, right. I imagine I'm probably right in agreement with you uh, in regards to the work of the heart, what God is saying and doing. Um, it's not something that you're either be, you know, denied blessings or be blessed for, uh, mm -hmm. but rather the blessing would be seeing your, your donation, your offering used very well in your local church setting. So, or in a global setting, whatever ministry you decide to support. So yeah. Um, yeah. Amen. I look forward to getting uh, that resource. So uh, that being said, uh, before I open up, and if you don't mind, I'll ask, uh, I'll allow some folks here if they want to have a question or a comment to offer up. Uh, but before I do that, tell us how we can get your books, how we can access your church uh, program. And also you mentioned the uh, the New Covenant Way. Uh, let us know how we can, how can we learn the best from Jane, Pastor Jamie? Yeah. Okay. So first, if you, if you want the books, the, the easiest way to do that is just to go to Amazon and just type my name in the search bar, Jamie Escamilla. So I spell my name, Jamie, a little differently. It's J-A-M-E-Y. So some, I had some friends that called me E-Y at one time. And then my last name, Escamilla, and that's a Spanish last name, E-S-C-A-M-I-L-L-A, -L -L which I'm sure you're going to see it on this post anyways. But if you just type my name, uh, the two books should come up and you can get them there. Uh, and then if you want a, more information about uh, my church, uh, New Covenant Church of El Campo, just go to newcovenantchurchelcampo.com. And uh, so the, our website, honestly, it's not big and bad. Um, it's it's kind of just plain. You know, we, we really just put our updates and our sermons on there. So if you want to see like the sermons, if you're more interested in the messages, uh, friend me on Facebook. And you can also like our Facebook page, New Covenant Church of El Campo. 
And just like every other church, we go live on Sundays and Wednesdays. So you can be kept in the loop about our church on that. Uh, as far as New Covenant Way goes, you can go to newcovenantway.com. And there you'll see all of our articles and you'll see uh, videos. And we also have a bunch of free resources on there too. Like I actually, right now, there's, a, there's an entire course on Matthew 24. Uh, it's like 2.5 hours of content. content and it's just me teaching Matthew 24. There's uh, some Bible study cheat sheets that kind of have different subjects in the Bible. You can learn 10 Greek, 10 Hebrew words, some free resources on there. There's like a New Testament reading plan. And so all you have to do is just subscribe and then you get all that stuff, you know, sent to your inbox. So um, that's the best way to get that content. And then of course, I'm always on Facebook. So the best way like to reach me, if you don't have my personal phone number, is just to message me on Facebook. Amen. Thank you. And I'm glad you uh, pronounced your last name. If you notice, I avoided it the whole podcast. <laughs> uh, the, the reason being is I was doing the same thing I did with quesadillas back in the day. Uh, I forgot that quesadilla. Escamilla, yeah. That makes perfect sense. All like right. Tortillas. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. Um, thank you, brother, for your time. I'm going to go ahead and unmute some mics. And thank you for all those resources. I know I wrote some notes. Hopefully most of you that are tuned in here took some notes and know how to gain access to some of these resources. Uh, you know, there's not a Sunday that goes by that I have somebody message me and say, where can I find a church in my area? I'm like, well, if you can't find a church in your area, here's a host of links. All right, uh, there you, you go. <laughs> you know, connect with, and then prayerfully, we know that church is far more than watching a, a sermon. Um, find your way to be a part of these communities. If you're in the area, uh, you know, plug into these communities and uh, be a part Amen. of what, what God is doing. So I'm going to unmute some mics and let's see uh, what's some feedback we have from our guests. Hey, may I say before I run? Hey, jump in, brother. Yes. Um, as far as the kingdom is concerned, uh, Jesus came, you know, to, uh, to, to, to bring the kingdom. And that's our job as well, to further it, because our scripture says, you know, we will do greater things. Uh, I believe that's part of it, as far as, you know, uh, demonstrating and showing the kingdom to the world. Uh, and then um, I learned from Jamie when he was talking about the seven churches, as far as being in between Rome and Jerusalem. You know, I, I wasn't aware of that. That little, that little bit, you know, helped me a great deal. Mm. And then as far as um, his uh, question about revelation and things in the millennium, you know, what I, what I had learned was when Jesus come, came, came out bodily form, that was to fulfill um, uh, Jonah, you know, being in a, uh, in a in a belly of the fish for three days, and then Jesus being in the belly of the earth three days, uh, and, and and in the Old Testament, everything that they needed to see was physical, but we're in spiritual currently. So for that point, for that part, you know, being Jesus is the fulfillment of the old covenant. You know, he came out physically, you know, to fulfill the prophecy of Jonah, and then the millennium. <clears throat> what I had learned was that, okay, uh, I'm going by memory. Now, the millennial is at the end of the millennial will be the end of the age. So the being that the end of the age had occurred and the millennium being a long period of time, being that the millennium, rather the end of the age had occurred, the end of the millennium had to have been, had to have occurred because all of the prophecies pertaining to what would happen at the end of the age, including the resurrection, you know, had to have occurred, you know, in 70 AD, you know, that can be looked in further, you know, I, I can't give all of the logistics because, you know, it's a time consuming topic, but mm -hmm. that's what I had wanted to share. Amen. Thank you. And of course, uh, spoken like a true student of Dr. Don K. Preston. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got, a, I got a few of Don K. Preston's books too. So yeah, that's, he's that's a awesome. Great resource. And, uh, you know, so yeah, Edward, uh, obviously, you know, the full preterist community or the preterist community by and large. Uh, we have a lot of distinctions in regards to the way that we're outlining the millennium. So uh, it's an area for further study. Uh, Edward, you, you put it together rather well. I appreciate your thoughts there. Jamie, I wasn't sure if you wanted to respond to anything Edward had shared. Yeah, no, that, that's, uh, that's, uh, that, that's great. That kind of helps me kind of understand a little bit more of the, you know, the full preterist side of things, uh, you know, as far as like the physical body and the spiritual body and things like that goes. So I'm always curious to learn more about about what, you know, full predators say about that. So just one quick question. Um, maybe you guys can help me on this. So the thousand year reign, uh, when, when did that occur? Can you guys help me with that? Edward, you want me to jump in? Please. 
uh, what I would what I would offer up and what I believe Edward and Dr. Don K. Preston would challenge would uh, the distinction would be when we say the thousand years, I know you had brought up a, a long period of time. Now, in some cases, that can be the case. Uh, we would also make the distinction that it can also just be a completed period of time. So um, the thousand being, you know, for example, uh, imagery that we often bring up would be the cattle on a thousand hills. Mm. Uh, it's not giving you, you know, a numerical value. It's not even saying he owns all these cattle and giving you a large number. It's saying even if there was four, God owns mm. all of them. Um, and then also another uh, usage would be in the Old Testament when David's going up against armies and it says, you know, a thousand will fall at your right hand, mm -hmm. a thousand will fall at your left. Whether it's four or four million, that's right. not the point. It's that all of the people that come up against you, the completed amount will be put will be put asunder. So right. um, that's where we would take the word thousand and maybe make a distinction that it, it doesn't have to be a long period of time. So I would posit the uh, I have a teaching on this. I might send you if you're interested. Um, Revelation 20, binding, reigning, loosing, and destruction. Those are the four elements that I see happening in the millennium. There's the binding of Satan, there's the loosing of Satan, there's the reigning of the saints, and then there's the destruction of the Satan. Now, obviously, what needs to happen is we need to outline what's the adversary, what's the Satan mm -hmm. magnified in the book of Revelation. And when we understand that, the full preterist, at least the, the view that I hold to, there's a, again, this is important to mention. This is a divided topic that, you know, mm -hmm. even in the full preterist community. So, you know, it's yeah. not like the full preterist community has it all figured out or something. Right. Um, you know, uh, I would posit from 30, from the ministry of Jesus Christ, when he bound Satan, we read, I believe it's Matthew chapter 12, up until the destruction of that adversary, the Romans and the Jews coming against the church in AD 70, uh, that would be the destruction that I see. So I would say from 30, 33, however you put that together, right. um, 70 is that period of the millennial reign where the saints reigned with Christ through the tribulation. And ultimately they saw the end of that system that was coming against them. So that's a summary. Uh, I could send you a teaching, of course, that would further outline that. And, you know, you might agree, you might not agree, or it might even cause both of us to disagree. So who yeah, knows? no, no, I'll take, I'll take the resource. Uh, like I said, that sounds like it'll, it'll help me a lot. Uh, I, I, like I said, I, I do have uh, many full preterist friends and I have heard them say that before. So I just wanted to be sure I was, I was that you guys were were like a square on that. You know, the millennial reign is basically from thirty to seventy. Yes, that's basically, basically. that's one view. That's the, uh, the if there's a title for it. Again, these days we have titles for everything. Right. Um, it, it, that would be the trans millennial view. Mm -hmm. uh, and I say that cautiously because I know brothers like Ed Stevens, uh, other men that are you know very knowledgeable in regards to full preterism, they disagree. So you know that, yeah. that's where you know I encourage folks to just study through. And find your conviction and help, you know, allow that to help you be consistent in how you're undoing uh, or doing your Bible study, for that matter. Amen. Okay, Amen. Thank, thank you for that. Thank All you, right, Chief, for your time. Okay, God bless. God bless you. Edward's going to enjoy lunch. Hopefully, we'll, all of us are going to get there soon. <laughs> uh, Zach, I see you're unmuted. Did you want to jump in here and share some thoughts? Hey, good morning. Good morning. Um, yeah, I just like thank you, Jamie, so much for coming on here and sharing your heart with us. Um, it's really great to hear from you um, and a real encouragement um, to hear from you. Uh, my, I, I mean, there's a lot that I could ask. I mean, I would, you talked a little bit about Old Covenant versus New Covenant. Um, is, is there a way that you could sort of succinctly summarize, you know, how you see the relevance of the old covenant in a new covenant age and, you know, to what extent there's maybe continuity or discontinuity between the covenants? Yes, that's okay. Great question, Zach. Like, uh, I don't know if you guys have heard of, uh, Andy Stanley, well, he's pretty popular, but one time he had said his quote, he had said that we need to unhitch from the Old Testament. And I, I'm kind of paraphrasing that a bit, but he said, we, us Christians here in the new covenant need to unhitch from the Old Testament. And he got a lot of backlash for that because the word he actually should have used was old covenant. So the way I see it is like this. The Old Testament is the written part of your Bible, and that is still useful because it teaches us the stories and it shows us how it gives us all the pictures, you know, of, of Christ and the things that happen in the new covenant. 
but the old covenant that they were under, the Mosaic covenant that goes from Exodus chapter 20, you know, when Moses gave the, uh, when Moses gave the commandments all the way until Jesus' death, well, we're not under that old covenant anymore. So those old covenant laws and regulations and all the rules don't apply to us anymore as new covenant Christians. So we are not under the old covenant law here under the new covenant, because when Jesus died, he brought in the new covenant by his blood. So the old covenant has been done away with. And what that means for us is that we're not governed by the law, that we're not govern governed by the Mosaic laws, but we're governed by the Holy Spirit now. And we're governed by, by Jesus Christ now. And so that that new covenant came into effect when he died but it's like i think mike had said it uh kind of closer to the beginning of the uh, our episode here a lot of people today we're, we're all under a new covenant but a lot of people today their old covenant mindset it i said that kind of weird but they have an old covenant mindset here in the new covenant meaning they're trying to earn favor and achieve righteousness with god based on their works based on what they do i have to keep this law or i have to keep this one and they're picking and choosing which mosaic laws they want to keep and you know i have to stay out of the bar i can't cuss i can't drink i can't smoke i gotta do all this stuff and that's what makes me righteous before god but that's old covenant living because the old covenant says you have to earn your righteousness with God by keeping the laws and the old commandments. Well, in the new covenant, the Bible says that no flesh is justified by the law and that now the new covenant and our complete faith in Jesus Christ is what makes us righteous. It's just that what I was saying was that a lot of people don't really understand that because like I said, they, they still try to keep some of these old covenant laws and they try to bring them over into the new covenant when all of that old covenant has been done away with. So the old Testament, you know, the writings and, and the stories and, and the, and some of the lessons that were taught are still beneficial to us today. But as far as the covenant goes, we're not under that old covenant anymore. So a lot of people think that like, everything in your old Testament is not old covenant because the old covenant did not begin until Exodus 20. So everything before that, you know, Genesis, Noah, Abraham, all that stuff was before the old covenant. And then everything in your new Testament of your written Bible is not new covenant either because the new covenant didn't come into effect until Jesus died. So I actually teach my church that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are actually old covenant books because the new covenant wasn't in effect while Jesus was here on the earth. The new covenant didn't come into effect until, G until Jesus shed his blood and brought it in here. But you see this, the significance of understanding that is it, it bases how you live for God. It bases how you see the Lord, how you see yourself. You know, you start seeing that, Hey, I'm righteous by God through faith in Jesus Christ alone. And it's not by any works that I do. And then what that does when you take on that mentality, it actually helps you produce good works in your life. You know, the works that the Holy Spirit wants you to live and the way that God wants you to live is going to self effortlessly and naturally just flow out of you because you're focused on your righteousness, uh, your righteousness in Jesus Christ. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, yes, no, that was, that was good. Yeah. Um, uh, one other question sort of related to that. How do you see, how does, your perspective on the new covenant, um, how does that inform your theology of worship? Worship. Uh, so, well, I mean, I still think that worship is still important. You know, I still think that God wants us, you know, to worship him and wants, wants us to give him adoration and praise. Like, I, you know, I think that, I think that it's kind of, kind of goes back to the way I was talking at the beginning of the episode, you know, a relationship of God is still so important. And uh, I'm kind of glad you mentioned that, Zach, because a lot of us grace people, us new covenant people here, we get lazy sometimes. And we don't think that like there's anything left that needs to be done. You know, we can just sit and just come to church and just kind of enjoy God. Well, the Bible says that everybody has been reconciled, that, that God has reconciled himself to the world. And then it says, but you be reconciled to God now. Mm -hmm. So God has made the relationship between us and him right. Now we need to enter into that relationship. Well, how do we do that? By giving our life to Jesus Christ, by putting our faith in him, by worshiping him, just like you said. And so we, you know, like at our church, you know, we, we believe very heavily in, in just 
building that relationship, you know, building that life of worship and praise, you know, and, and to me, like worship is, it's a lifestyle, you know, a lot of people get it confused and they think, well, like worship is just music. Well, no, that's, that's technically, that's not it. You know, you can worship God without music because worship is your lifestyle. You know, it's just giving him praise and, and thanking him for who he is, acknowledging him for who he is in your life, you know, and, and we can, we, we are still required and we still need to do that here under the new covenant. Amen. If I might just add one thing in that, well, our opening Psalm where I read from Psalm 13 talked about singing a song to the Lord. I don't believe that that's the song that we often think about where, you know, you have your guitar. It's, it's a song in your heart, uh, something that you know, transcends words, lyrics, musical instruments, etc. cetera. Uh, it's a disposition of the heart. Amen. Amen. Zach, any other thoughts you want to share? I know. I just, again, thank you, Jamie, for, for joining us and we pray your continued blessings on, on you and your, your congregation. Amen. Thank you, Zach, very much. Nice to meet you. Yeah. Nice to meet you. Amen. I see Richard, you're unmuted. Did you want to jump in here and share some thoughts? Yeah. Um, a couple of you, way. interesting things. Uh, uh, Jamie, I was stuck where you were, you know, well, you know, if you want to call yourself being stuck at the resurrection um, and it was uh, none other than Don K. Preston that eventually led me out of that. Um, and uh, once, you know, that picture became clear, it was wonderful. But I want to uh, point out in particular, over 12 years ago, uh, I published this document on the internet, tithinginfo.com. And it, 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 I, I just want to read one brief paragraph from the, from the very top of it, because I've run into the same uh, issues that uh, Mike had mentioned. It says, this document exposes mandated tithing. Mm -hmm. That's the key word, mandated. Mm -hmm. Corrupt teaching and manipulated guilt-driven giving. The sound biblical principle that churches and ministers can be supported by those they serve is not changed, destroyed, or diminished mm -hmm. by this document. By the way, it's, it's anti-mandated tithing. So, comma, you know, if you are just cheap and don't want to give, this article is not for you. However, if you need freedom from mandated tithing and other forms of manipulated guilt-driven giving, this article is for you. Uh, because I, I had people writing me after I published this, and I guess they never read that paragraph because they, they would just, you know, be denouncing giving it all. Mm -hmm. um, and that's definitely not what scripture teaches. I have no problems with with even very wealthy pastors, um, provided they're not manipulating the giving. And uh, because I, I came from some of the what, masters of uh, profiteering, that not only would they teach mandated tithing, but they would teach double and triple tithing. Uh, they would say, well, you know, the mandated tithing, that just opens the window of blessing. But if you want blessings to flow through, you know, <laughs> you know, I guess there's a wind, you know, the, if you double tie, you know, there's a wind and the blessings can now flow in. I mean, it just got to the point. It was just so ridiculous. I finally did my own study and uh, it's tithinginfo.com. It's been up there for a long time and it might have been used by you at some point. I don't know, uh, Jamie, but it was, the, you know, I, it was good hearing you. Um, and uh, that's all I wanted to say. Awesome. Yeah, I'm gonna have to check that 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 out. Tithinginfo.com. That's great. You know, I, I like that you had pointed that out, Richard, because um, it's very important that we remember that we're not saying not to give. You know, that's not what we're saying. That's why I make it very clear in the book. Tithing is not the same thing as giving. Tithing literally means ten percent. Giving means just giving. You know, so. Uh, but I, I've, I like what you said, because I've heard a lot of uh, different ministers who they kind of just they kind of just develop their own rules about tithing. You know, like, for instance, they read Malachi three and they read the part about, hey, give your tithe and you're going to be blessed. And then they skip verse nine that says, if you don't, you're going to be cursed. And then they go right to verse 10 that says, I'm going to open up the windows of blessing on you. So it's like they want to keep the blessings of tithing, but they don't want to take the curses with tithing as well. But we can't do that. You know, we have to take all the scripture. If Malachi 3 is for us today, well, then tithing, then, then getting cursed from not tithing is also for us today, too. You can't pick and choose and just develop your own 
man-made rules about tithing, you know? So, and again, I'm not the tithing police. If you want to give 10% of your money, do it. I tell my church all the time, the Bible says to be a cheerful giver, but even if you're angry when you give it, I'll still take it <laughs> because we need to be supported. But, you know, just let's not, let's not just assume things about the word of God and just make our own rules about the, the thing of tithing, you know, and, and, and put it over people's lives that you have to do this in order to experience blessing or even put it over people's lives that you should do this. Because if I come to you and I say, you should do it, that kind of means like you need to do it then. Right. Well, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible doesn't say we should tithe. It just says, give a bountiful gift. Just be generous with your giving. Well, how much is that? I can't tell you that only God can share you. Only God can give you that information, but thanks for sharing that. Yeah, and, and you know, one time I, I had a min- I was talking to a minister who was taking issue with my my article, and he said, you know, that if you're not tithing, you're robbing God. You're, you're a thief. I said, well then, Malachi like three. Why why do you take the money from all these non tithers? <laughs> you know, right. Why are you participating in their thievery? You know? And he didn't quite know point. what to say to that. <laughs> That's a good point. Hey, it it goes back to just understanding, you know, the context of scriptures, you know. As, as you guys probably already know, Malachi 3 is not written to new covenant believers. You know, it's, it's written to the old covenant priest. And, but, you know, what a tithe advocator says is just, well, let's figure out a way to apply this scripture to our life. And, but, you know, we need to keep scriptures in context. You know, that's the, to me, it's very clear. I think if tithing was a principle or if it was suggested or if God really wanted us to do it, then Paul would have told us to in some of his letters or that it would be somewhere in the new covenant make sure you give your tithes because that gives you a blessing, but that's not anywhere in there. It just says, give a bountiful gift, be generous with your giving, support the ministry, support your ministers. That's it. No percentage required. Amen. Well said, brother. Thank you, Richard. It's good to hear from you. I'm glad you're here with us this morning. Uh, Vicki, I've unmuted your mic to see if you wanted to participate in anything. I know we're getting close to the, uh, thank you, by the way, brother, for your extra time. We went a little over our hour. Yeah, no problem. All right. Well, Vicky might be busy. What I wanted to do is just bring us to winding down here. Uh, brother, I'm going to ask you to uh, pray here in a moment. Uh, before I do that, do you have any other things you wanted to share before I just share some announcements and some other things and then ask you to close in prayer? Yeah, uh, sure. Uh, I would just say if I can just tell everybody out there, if, if you guys, you know, if you want any advice from little old Pastor Jamie over here, I would just say I would leave you with this. Learn the word of God and value teaching in your life. Okay. Don't just go to church and get a powerful word and then go home and do nothing with it, but learn the word of God value teaching in your life and build your relationship with God. All that stuff is so important. So I would just challenge you guys to understand why you believe what you believe. Don't take people's words for it, but study for yourself to show yourself approved learn the word of God, because it's like nourishment to your soul. And, you know, when you, when you do good Bible study and when you get teaching inside of you, good, good, wholesome teaching that will actually help build your relationship with God. It'll help grow your worship. It'll help grow your church attendance. You know, you'll be more passionate about the Lord. You know, a lot of people, they, they, they don't have a good relationship with God because they don't, they don't know what a relationship of God is. You know, they, they don't know why they believe what they believe. They're just kind of confused, just kind of going to church, you know, but if you can learn the word of God and value teaching in your life, you know, be taught by somebody and, and, and also teach yourself. I believe that uh, that'll help build your relationship with God and get closer to the Lord. And it's going to make everything worth it. Amen. Well said. Thank you, brother. Uh, just to, to piggyback off of that in all your learning, in all your learning and all your listening and all your valuing the things of God, we are called to bless others with the things we've been blessed by. Uh, I often say bless. Uh, you've been blessed to bless. Uh, you know, so again, hopefully you've, uh, you've learned a lot this morning. You, you have opportunity to share those things with others. Uh, sure enough, right in line with that, talk about God speaking. Uh, this morning's common prayer ended with this thought. And this is why really everything that Pastor Jamie shared with us this morning, everything my thoughts are thinking about, kind of go back to this prayer. It says, God, our provider, all good gifts come from you. Make us so thankful for your gifts that we cannot help but share them with others. Own us as your fools, as we abandon the stuff of this world for the treasures of your kingdom. Again, just an admonition this morning for each of us to bless others with the things we've been blessed by. Uh, So if you have good teaching, share it with others. If you have the relationship with God, share it with others. If you have money, 
share it with the church, share it with Amen. others and bless others. So uh, a lot of good thoughts shared this morning. Um, a couple of announcements I'll make uh, known to you this morning. Um, tonight, we have a study going through. We talked about the resurrection. Interestingly enough, uh, I've been teaching through the resurrection on Tuesday nights at 7.30 p.m. We had a brief hiatus. Uh, however, we're getting back to it. 7.30 Eastern tonight here. Same Zoom number, same call-in number. Uh, you could be a part of that by watching through my personal Facebook page. Uh, or MGW Apologetics. That's my apologetics ministry. Uh, 7.30 p.m. We'll be diving in on the hope of Israel. We've been journeying from obviously Genesis, and we're going chronologically through every resurrection text found in the Bible. So we're entering, I believe, now into the prophetic literature. We covered uh, Genesis, the law of Moses, and we also covered the wisdom literature, uh, Psalms and Job. You see some references there to resurrection. We've previously talked about that. If you visit my personal blog site, mianogonewild.wordpress.com. I have outlines going through that study. I believe we're at about part six at this point. Um, so that's tonight at 7.30. Tomorrow, we have another interview here on the Preterist Power Hour. We're going to be joined by Micah Stevens. Uh, Micah Stevens has written quite a few books in regards to the last days ended in AD 70. Uh, then uh, we have uh, the books on hell. Uh, hell is not real is one of his books. Um, and he has quite a few others leaning in on that. So that will be at 11 a.m. Eastern tomorrow. So we encourage you to be here. Same Facebook page, same Zoom session, same call-in number. And um, by the way, visit powerofpreterism.wordpress.com. Reason being is later on today, I'll be uploading a blog that will share with you the thoughts I shared on yesterday's podcast. And what we had challenged you was, uh, number one, to be reading through the Jewish Parshat for the week. Uh, that includes Deuteronomy chapters one through three. Isaiah chapter one, and interestingly enough, Matthew chapter 24. So uh, if you do that reading, you can get a good hearty understanding of some of the things going on in Old Covenant and New Covenant Bible prophecy. And um, so that's one of the challenges. And then also I shared with you, Steve Gregg recently wrote a book called uh, Why Not Full Preterism? And uh, what we're going to do is go back to our Throwback Thursday session is going to be reviewing the debate he had done with Dr. Don K. Preston, who we mentioned on this program. Steve Gregg debated him back in 2013. So we're gonna review that debate. And then also Preteris Voice has continued uh, doing a review of the book. Uh, so we'll talk through some of his thoughts uh, in regards to Steve Gregg's book. So all of that and more. And then lastly, I have to make mention of this. Uh, in the full Preterist community, we actually have a holiday that we're celebrating this coming Sunday. Uh, it's New Jerusalem Day, Parousia Day. I'll go ahead and share some graphics with you on the screen just for you to uh, be celebrating this in your assembly. Uh, we call it Parousia Sunday. And uh, remember Pella, remember the saints gathering to Pella during the destruction of Jerusalem. Come to understand more about what we're saying about uh, the destruction of Jerusalem. Many of you might know the Jewish community uh, laments the destruction of Jerusalem this coming week. And uh, with Tisha B'Av, that is the Jewish feast or the Jewish uh, moment of commemoration where they think about the temple, they, they pray for obviously a new temple um, in that regard, whereas we as Christians should be celebrating the new temple. Uh, we should recognize that Christ has indeed accomplished that. And uh, there's also another graphic, Parousia Sunday, celebrating the new covenant, world without end. We will have a fulfilled Lord's table uh, here at the Blue Point Bible Church this coming Sunday. We encourage you to join with us for worship service at 1030 a.m. And we'll also be watching a film about the destruction of Jerusalem this coming Sunday. And we also encourage congregations to uh, show up to church wearing purple this coming Sunday to celebrate the royalty of Christ, the presence of Christ in his church. That's what I have for announcements. Again, powerofpreterism.com will afford you the opportunity for all these resources I've mentioned and more. Brother, do you mind closing us in a word of prayer? Sure thing, sure thing. Let's pray right now. Father, in Jesus' name, we just thank you, Lord, for your spirit and for your word that went forth today, Lord. I know, Father, and I believe that, you know, everyone that was watching, Lord, they received something good. And I believe that it's it's going to be life changing for them, Father. So, you know, if there's any needs that, that the people had that your viewers had, you know, I believe that, hey, they could be touched, you know, right now as we were speaking, because your word was going forth, Father. And we just appreciate your spirit. And we thank you, Lord, for a finished work. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that we can just sit here and enjoy your kingdom. We can enjoy you and we can learn from you, Father. And I pray, Lord, that the people watching, they would see how blessed they truly are inside of you because they're in you, Lord. They are one with you. I pray that the eyes of their understanding would be opened 
And I pray that they would go after more teaching, you know, more learning, you know, so that they can have a better faith and they can grow their faith and they can learn more about you, Father. So I just speak a special blessing, Lord, over all those who are watching today, Lord. And we thank you for Michael, Lord, and just for his heart, Lord, and for his ministry and, you know, bringing just the truth of preterism to the table, Lord. I pray that you continue to provide the resources, Father, for him to be able to do that and just bless his heart, Father, and just let him continue to do this work. Surround him with the right people and the right places, the right plans, Father. And we thank you for all of this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. God bless you. God bless New Covenant Church. And we pray uh, we'll continue to have good communication and see the power of God go before us. Amen. Thank you so much for having me, Michael. Look forward to seeing you soon. Amen. God bless. Go in peace, brother. God bless.